is brought to you by Head Start Basketball. We all love to watch film and check out other programs and, and try to think creatively about what can we add, what do we need to drop, how can we adjust what we do. Arlen Galloway is in his 11th season as the head men's basketball coach at Wentworth Institute of Technology in Boston, Massachusetts, where he has won over 100 games during his tenure. Galloway's 17 wins in 2022-23 marked the most in any one of his 10 seasons. Prior to arriving at Wentworth, Galloway spent two seasons as an assistant men's basketball coach in the Ivy League at Cornell University. He also spent two seasons as an assistant men's basketball coach at Middlebury College and two as an assistant coach at his alma mater, Kenyon College. During the 2006-2007 season, Galloway began his coaching career at Washington College in Maryland. A native of Wyndham, New Hampshire, Galloway was a four-year letter winner at Kenyon, where he played in 99 games over the course of his college career. Hey, Hoopheads, our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball are here to help your team train bigger and better with exclusive Black Friday savings all month long. Now until November 30th, get $3,500 off the Dr. Dish CT Plus and experience firsthand what the ultimate training solution is all about. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com and follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoopheads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel, All-Star, and CT models. Those are some great deals, Hoopheads. Get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. Hi, this is Dan Evans, head men's basketball coach at the University of North Georgia, and you're listening to the Hoopheads podcast. Are you a basketball coach or trainer looking to connect with new clients? U-Train is here to help you manage your business and reach a wider audience. Best of all, it's completely free to use. Simply create a profile, list your services, post pins, and share your free booking website link. You can set your own rates and schedule and use U-Train to communicate with clients, manage appointments, handle refunds, and collect payments automatically. So why wait? Join U-Train today for free and start reaching new clients. That's U-Train, U-T. R A I N U Train. Download today on the App Store and Google Play. Prepare like the pros with the all new Fast Draw and Fast Scout. Fast Draw has been the number one play diagramming software for coaches for years. You'll quickly see why Fast Model Sports has the most compelling and intuitive basketball software out there. For a limited time, Fast Model is offering Hoopheads listeners 15% off Fast Draw and Fast Scout. Just use the code HHP15 at checkout to grab your discount, and you'll be on your way to more efficient game prep and improved communication with your team. Fast Model also has new coaching content every week on its blog, plus play and drill diagrams on its play bank. Check out the links in the show notes for more. Fast Model Sports is the best in basketball. Grab pen and paper before you listen to this episode with Arlen Galloway, head men's basketball coach at Wentworth Institute of Technology in Boston, Massachusetts. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here without my co-host Jason Sunkel tonight, but I am pleased to be joined by Arlen Galloway, the head men's basketball coach at Wentworth Institute of Technology. Arlen, welcome to the Hoop Heads Pod. Thanks, Mike. Been looking forward to this. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Thrilled to have you on. Looking forward to diving into all the things that you've been able to do in your career. Let's start by going back in time to when you were a kid. Tell me a little bit about some of your first experiences with the game of basketball and what you remember. Sure. Um, It's kind of funny, to be honest. I really wasn't into basketball or sports when I was really young. I think um, I think the switch was flipped you know, 10 or 11 years old, something around that. But um, honestly, I I wasn't really a kid where somebody put a basketball in my crib or anything like that. I was really active. I grew up in uh, New Hampshire and played outside a lot, um, but got to, you know, somewhere around 10 or 11 years old in in sports. The sports bug kind of got me then. And to be honest, uh, the first sport I really loved was football. Um, and that, that memory is actually 
pretty clear uh, just to tell a short story. So I said I lived in New Hampshire and we had family. Uh, my grandparents lived about an hour away and we would visit decently. And uh, anybody in the family who was a sports fan was, of course, a Boston or New England sports fan. And I remember it was a Sunday in September and my grandfather was coming to our house and his one requirement was that the Patriots game was on. And um, it was season opener, Patriots, Dolphins, uh, Dan Marino, 500 yards and five touchdowns. Um, Drew Bledsoe was the quarter. I think it was his second year. And uh, before Tom Brady, Drew Bledsoe was was a stud. Um, he was, you know, he went for 450 yards and four touchdowns. And uh, I, I thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. All I wanted to do, honestly, was play football. Um, but my parents were not interested in allowing me at a young age to play tackle football. So I think that actually helped push me into basketball a little bit more. Um, so started, started playing a lot of basketball and took it really seriously. And my basketball memories when I was young are, are like, um, like a lot of guys, you know, summer camp stuff, uh, mostly in New Hampshire, a few others. And then, um, growing up in New Hampshire when I did, uh, a few years older than me was a guy whose name a lot of people probably know, Matt Bonner. Um, you know, was pro, I mean, you could argue Matt Bonner, Duncan Robinson, but he was a fantastic high school player and he, he played at his public high school in New Hampshire for all four years. So one of my, one of my memories was every year when I was in junior high school, um, my grandfather would get me and we would go to the New Hampshire state tournament semifinals or finals. So in New Hampshire, the state tournament is a little bit later than some other States. It's like mid March, late March. And uh, my grandparents lived in Concord, the town where Matt Bonner played at Concord high school. And so, you know, Matt Bonner was in every newspaper every week for, it seemed like three or four years, you know, he was six, nine, Incredible player, committed to Florida prior to senior year. But every year it was basically, could somebody beat Concord High? So, um, so my grandfather and I would, grandfather and I would drive up to, um, UNH hosted the state semifinals and finals at, uh, Lundholm Gym, which is, was a big old gym. They've, they've updated a little bit, but those are really cool memories for me. I saw some great games. Um, I saw Matt Bonner double teamed from tip off to the end of the game constantly. Um, guy in front of him, guy guarding behind him, and then three guys guarding the four other players. Uh, so that was at, at a young age, certainly something I, I had not seen before. It kind of reminds me of, you know, Jimmy Patsos and Steph Curry, uh, back, back when he was at Davidson. And, uh, so anyways, those were a couple of my, my early memories. Do you remember about Bonner? physically compared to the other high school kids that he was playing against well he was taller <laughs> that that's what always helps yeah that helps he was i mean he was six nine six ten um and he could shoot you know i mean he was uh maybe not the quickest guy in the world but that was probably his only his only weakness um but he could play in the post and he was he was really really strong uh and he could really step out and shoot and you know and and he played really hard. He was intense and a competitor, a competitor. And, you know, for his, for his time at Concord High, he really, really developed a reputation in the state and in the area. I mean, he was a national level player in, you know, New Hampshire is made up of a lot of small towns. Concord's, Concord's the biggest town. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of stories about his work ethic. He, he was also valedictorian in his high school class. So he was just one of these, um, one of these guys that, that worked really, really hard at everything. And, um, you know, certainly a lot of people from my home state liked, enjoyed following his college career and, and professional career. What was the basketball scene like for you as a high school player in terms of finding places to play and get better in the off season? And just in terms of the availability of pickup basketball and how you got better while you were a high school player? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I actually, for high school, I did not go to high school in New Hampshire. Um, so I, um, when I was going into that, 
that age, that process, my parents um, made some decisions and we looked at private schools. So um, I did that whole process, which honestly is like a college application and interview process just for high schools. So um, <laughs> as, as you probably know, New England has a lot of um, a lot of private schools. Uh, so I ended up I, I attended St. Mark's School, which is about 30 minutes west of Boston, uh, it's about an hour and a half from where I lived, but I, I lived on campus. It was a residential kind of high school, boarding school experience. Um, so that changed things uh, a little bit. You know, because of that, I certainly wasn't as connected in the town and the area back home. So I probably did not have as easy of a time. Um, but I, I worked pretty hard to seek out opportunities. Um, a couple of places, there's, you know, men's league, summer leagues, and, uh, you know, I would work basketball camps in the summer uh, back home or, you know, in southern New Hampshire and, and would kind of connect that way. But a lot of it had to be on my own. Um, you know, I, I, to, be, to be honest, I never played any AAU. I don't even know how much there was. There, there certainly was. Um, there was at least one really, really good program, and that was the best players in the state. That was like Matt Bonner and some others. It was the Granite State Raiders back then. Um, but we just were not a family – that really was pursuing a lot of, um, you know, travel kind of, uh, youth opportunities, uh, around that in, in my family, sports were to be pursued through the scholastic experience, if that makes sense. So, um, no, so, absolutely. so getting better, you know, you know, in the younger years was in my driveway and at camps and then in high school, um, and college was, Hey, summer leagues and also in my driveway and also at the park down the street. So, um, my family moved you know, one town over uh, a year or two before I went to high school. And, hey, that town had a gorgeous outdoor park with four really nice outdoor courts. And I certainly put my time in uh, there. So, What's your favorite memory from playing high school basketball? Um, that's a, it's a great question. Uh, you know, I've listened to your podcast, so I kind of, you know, I know some of the questions that are coming my way. But. Uh, I can't point at one the, the whole experience for me was was really, really good. It was a huge part of my growth as, as a player, but also um, just kind of as I think as a person. And, uh, you know, I think my high school experience is what gave me a chance to be a college player because I, I, I was not super talented. I had really one strength um, as a three point shooter, but was no, certainly no great athlete and no great player, but I played in a really, really serious high school program. And in high school, uh, our, our team at St. Mark's was, was everything to me. So, um, I played with kids from all over the country. Some of our best players were from California, New York city. Um, you know, the, the program had already had a few scholarship players come through there and then they had a whole lot more after, um, you know, they won the league a few times. Uh, I played for a guy, Dave Lubick, who no longer coaches, which is, um, is a shame, but he was an extremely important figure in my life and in my high school development. And, and he just made it so intense and, and demanding. And he made St. Mark's basketball so important to all of us. So I, I just was in a program with extremely high standards and high expectations. They had won the New England championship in their division the year before I got there. So I went in, I went in 1999 as a sophomore um, and myself and one of my classmates were the last two guys cut. So I was cut my sophomore year. Maybe that, you know, that was not a good moment, but I thought that was pretty important because um, our coach, you know, I wasn't really a recruited guy. I did connect with coach in the process when I'm applying to schools and he certainly made time to make me feel welcome um, and kind of showcase the, the program, which the year before I was going to be there was, you know, extremely successful. And I believe they won the New England title that year. So um, for me, it was just the experience. Uh, you know, if I had gone to school, I, lo I love my home state, but it's not the highest level of basketball. Um, and if I had gone to school back home, I probably uh, would have ended up with more playing time and probably scoring a few more points. And, and that experience could also have been very good. But um, for me, I was just a part of something that was really, really important and really demanding. And it, and at that age, I can't really put my finger on why, but I just took basketball and sports really, really seriously. And so that was a good fit for me. 
Um, so, you know, I've probably never been in as good shape as I was back in high school. Like I was in better <laughs> shape in high school than I was in college. Um, so it was just really, really competitive. Um, again, not making the team sophomore year, I had to do everything. I knew I had to really, really do a lot to move forward and take a step forward. And then I, I made the team, I think, relatively easy as a junior, but I didn't play much as a junior. Um, so then that was the next step was, hey, I got to, you know, take that next step. And then senior year, um, I did play. Uh, but our two years were, by our expectation, slightly disappointing. Um, we always had high standards every year and we just, we probably underachieved a little bit those two years. And um, hopefully it's just a coincidence that I happen to be there involved <laughs> on the team those two years. So, um, but anyways, they had a great run a few years after that. Um, and have, you know, they've had some guys end up in the NBA and, and high major division one. And that's been fun to follow. Did you know that you wanted to play college basketball kind of once you got into hoops, even as you were going through that high school experiences or, or was it, okay, I got cut as a sophomore. I'm just focused on, I want to play high school basketball. Where was your mindset at? And then talk a little bit about the decision to go to Kenyon here in the state of Ohio. Sure. Um, no, I, I had very few, I had no thoughts early on. Um, you kind of said it. I, I was, you know, really singularly focused on just contributing to make first making the team and then trying to contribute and then, um, wanted us to be better and, uh, and, and win more. And I wanted to play in the NEPSEC playoffs and I wanted, you know, I wanted all these, these team success things that, um, you know, that I saw them have the year before I got there. So for me, it wasn't really a thought. Um, you know, to be honest, I, I don't have a ton of people in my family that, that played college sports and I, and I actually, I didn't have a concept for how big division three was. So, um, you know, for me, it was, after junior year, talking to uh, talking to coach a little bit, and you know, trying to ask him, hey, what just what should I be doing? And and for me, it was more from an angle of, hey, like I needed a more serious camp. I needed to kind of get out of what I was. I needed to you know build on what I was doing in the summer. And so he pointed me a couple of directions, and then I ended up. At, uh, back then, you know, all these companies and groups have changed. And that, I went to a Hoop Mountain camp, which back then was held at, um, I believe, Northfield Mount Hermon. And it was a, you know, competitive uh, kind of recruiting style camp for, for four or five days. And so that kind of put me in a gym with a lot of other good players. And I had to kind of realize, OK, you know, where do I stack up and that kind of thing. And, and I still, that summer, it's not like I got flooded with recruiting. I all of a sudden got a letter. I mean, this is, you know, this was an actual letter in the mail from a, a small school in Vermont. Um, you know, small, small state school in Vermont. And I was floored. I, I was, I was totally shocked. I didn't see myself, frankly, as a guy that could play college. Um, so, that was not a school that I was interested in for other reasons, but it was kind of a wake up call that, Hey, you know, maybe I've got a chance, you know, maybe I've got a chance. And so, so I started to think about it a little bit and, you know, more conversations with coach and then college counselor and, and that kind of thing. So that led to a little bit of, um, you know, a little bit of recruitment. Um, I think I ended up taking really one, you know, overnight visit back then we would never call it an official visit, but now I guess I have to call it, you know, I did one visit, uh, at a school and then I didn't get accepted to that school, <laughs> which I was surprised by. Um, <laughs> but you know, the basketball thing was kind of a piece of my college process, but the recruiting for the very little recruitment I had was very light. So I, I really had to focus on what do I like as a school? What do I like for location? You know, that, that kind of thing. So, and hope that basketball would work out. What did you think you wanted to do for a career at this point? I had no clue. I had absolutely no clue. Um, <laughs> I, I was not, you know, I just wasn't mature enough to think about it. I honestly was just trying to, um, was trying to get better grades and, uh, you know, write a good essay for the application and, and, and you know, be good in practice. Uh, that's, I was very, very short, short term uh, goals and, and thought process. So, um, you know, I kind of started to realize what types of classes I liked, what subject matter I liked a little bit more, which was you know, the history classes. Um, I, I did not excel in, 
uh, math or science and I wasn't really interested in it. So at least, but I needed, you know, I like, like many, um, not my students here, our, our students come in with very specific ideas for what they want to study, but I needed a general curriculum. I needed a liberal arts type of atmosphere in uh, academic program. So how does that lead to Kenyon? How do you discover Kenyon for people who aren't aware of Kenyon here yeah. in the state of Ohio, super high academic school? How do you find it? So, um, you know, went through a process of thinking about, you know, just making a school profile of, hey, what, what do I want um, with my college counselor and my parents a little bit. And it was kind of really came to smaller schools, uh, you know, smaller student population, uh, liberal arts type of academic curriculum um, and, you know, suburban at the at the most, you know, not I was not looking for a city or an urban college experience. Um, you know, so I, at St. Mark's is a small school, 320 ish students. It, I felt I felt like I had a really good experience. I think I had a very good kind of development and growth process there. And I felt like the people I knew, I knew them really well. Uh, I thought, think that was important to me to not be in, you know, and every, every person needs what's best for them. I, I didn't want to be in a class of a hundred kids um, or anything like that. So, um, so Kenyon got put on the list. So a bunch so I had a list of schools that kind of fit the criteria. Um, and three were in Ohio uh, or no, sorry, two, two of them were in Ohio. And um, the funny thing is I actually deposited, I chose a different school. So I chose a different school. So, a little bit late in the college process, not too late, but I'd already sent a lot of applications. And then a different teacher who I had for a number of classes at, at my high school came to me and said, Hey, I think you should really look at this school. You'd like it. Um, it was the University of the South in Tennessee, also known as Sewanee. Sewanee, yep. So I said, Okay, sure. You know, fired the common app that way. Um, my dad is from Tennessee originally. We have family there. Uh, he's from outside Knoxville. So, hey, there's a familiarity. People down there speak really highly of it. So um, I got accepted. I didn't get accepted in some other places that I was interested in. And like I said, we have family. So, hey, let's go visit. So, you know, after basketball season, during, you know, the spring break time, um, I did. I made a trip. I went. I went for this accepted student day. And uh, I had an incredible time. I had an incredible time. Like, I, I was like, I'm coming here. This place is awesome. Everybody's so nice. It's beautiful. Um, I had had limited contact with the coach, but you know, they just did the visit really well. Like I, I stayed in the dorm with some kids and just everybody loved it there. And everybody was like, yeah, you'll probably make the team. You'll be fine. No big deal. You know? So I was like, all right, this is great. I just loved it. And, and I said, okay, I'm going. And, um, and then a couple of weeks later, I got a phone call from, from an admissions officer at Kenyon and they said, I had been waitlisted. Sorry. I didn't say that earlier, but I've been waitlisted at Kenyon. They called me and said, Hey, are you still interested? And I said, uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. And I said, okay, well, um, we're taking you off the wait list and accepting you and you have 24 hours to let us know. So I went, you know, I went and found my coach. I went and found Dave Lubick and I kind of, cause he was the guy that I trusted the most and had the relationship with. And um, he happens to be from Chicago in the Midwest and had really close friends at some point in his life who went to Kenyon and really liked it. And he had been there and visited and, and really liked it. And I just went to him and I just said, hey, I just got accepted from Kenyon. You know, with Sewanee, I did not have like an official commitment to a coach. I had told the school I was going, but I didn't have, you know, someone personally that I had, had told. Um, so, coach put his hand on my shoulder. He just looked at me and said, you're going to Kenyon. I said, okay. And then, honestly, Mike, that was it. Um, I had not. This, I, do, so, I do. I, that was, I mean, that was, that, that was me, you know. Um, you know, rankings are, aren't everything and sometimes should are way over overblown. Um, but Kenyon's ranked in a pretty good place and that, that looks good for mom and dad. And so, and, you know, again, I, and here's what I do not recommend. I did not visit Kenyon. The first time I stepped foot on campus was moving in <laughs> freshman year. Um, I was a, kind of a simple guy. I was going to just make it work, you know. Um, and I, I did have some communication with the coach. Very, very, very limited more like phone tag, to be honest, but he knew my name. And um, so I said, yes. And then, you know, that was that. So what's the experience like college basketball at Kenyon? 
the adjustment from high school. Just tell me a little bit about your experiences there and then we can get into how those experiences, I'm assuming, led you into thinking that coaching was maybe where you wanted to end up. But talk a little bit about your experience as a player and then how that kind of leads into you getting involved in coaching. Yeah. So, um, my high school experience, I, I might have alluded to this earlier, but my high school experience really, really prepared me. So, um, the, the basketball program at that time was not in a great place. Um, and I was just used to working really, really hard and really expecting competition. And I figured that's what college basketball was like. So, you know, I went in in pretty good shape. And in the fall, I worked out a lot and played pickup. And, you know, one of a couple of my first reactions when I played pickup with the other freshmen and the returning players, I, I was kind of like, hey, I, I can hang. Like, I'm, I'm in the mix here. Um, right. You know, it wasn't a huge roster. And I, I just kind of was like, hey, I think I should be on this team. I think I can, I can be on the team. So that was, you know, that was, that was a good feeling, obviously. Um, and then our freshman year was really rough. It, we, we did not have a good year um, at all. And the coach left, um, and the coaching staff left, and then they hired a new coach. And then I played for a guy, Matt Croce, um, whose name you probably know, the head coach at Wittenberg now. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, so freshman year was, was really rough. From, from We just we didn't have a lot of talent. Um, you know, to be honest, our team needed a higher commitment level. Um, we needed collectively to have a little bit more of a work ethic and a little bit more priority on basketball. I, I We had – some great people on the team. I think we had a lot of guys who basketball was just to, to be really good in college as a team, you know, at any level, you know, it doesn't matter what level, but it really has to be a priority. And I think it kind of fit into people's lives, but you know, the, the year round commitment and just, just the commitment that was needed, I think started to come the next year. Um, it started to be really, you know, enforced and built, um, by by Matt, by Coach Croce. Um so we you know we, we took a couple steps forward and and got things moving in the right direction in the next couple of years. What is it about that experience at Kenyon that made you kind of think, hey, coaching might be something that I'd be interested in? Sure. Um you know I I think I didn't I didn't consciously or conscientiously really have this thought back then, but you know, we had a bad team my freshman year, and then in my junior year we weren't great either. I mean, we we were never our schedule was pretty tough. That league is great, but you know, we weren't hey, um, you know, challenging for an NCAA tournament bid. I, I think what I'm saying is, you know, we wins and losses were not what you dream of, and, and I still really really enjoyed the experience. You know, I still still wanted to come back the next day and come back the next year and keep working out. And, uh, in, in trying to build the program. So, you know, I think that was one thing. And hey, you didn't win as many games as you want, but I still really enjoyed it. And so I, I did not think seriously at all, um, about the college coaching thing until senior year. Um, to be honest, I kind of put off the serious stuff. I did a little resume work with the place. Um, on campus. And then uh, after the season, you know, I kind of had an agreement with my parents. I just want to focus on senior year. I want to focus on senior season. This is the last go around. And after after the season, I'll start to get serious about things. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, I'm so probably my, excited about that. Hey, bought finally myself some time. time. Finally getting a little serious. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the funny, funny thing was back then, I'm there in New Hampshire. I'm all the way in Ohio without a cell phone. So, um, you know, we have a dorm room phone and well, senior year is just an apartment phone. So, um, you know, and I was pretty independent. I just didn't need to, you know, at that point you're a senior and mom and dad trust you and all that stuff. So, um, but yeah, they probably were thrilled when I came home and, you know, didn't, didn't have a, a plan. So, um, but, you know, I started to, started to think more seriously about it, met with my coach. Um, and at the same time I was kind of, yeah, I wasn't two feet in at first. Um, you know, I think, I think some guys are totally in and then some were trying to, you know, dip their toe in the water and then that, and that was me. So I, I was a political science major. Um, that definitely <laughs> at times was more focused on hoops than, than school, but, you know, I did enjoy my major, um, a lot of people who study poli sci go into, go into law school, think about going to law school. 
there were certainly some people in my program. Um, I have a couple of attorneys in my family, so I was somewhat familiar. Um, but I, that was a big commitment. It's, it's obviously an expensive commitment. And I, I think I made a good decision to not go to law school just as a default. You know, hey, I, I didn't feel passionate about it, so I didn't want to do it. So I went through a job process a little bit. Um, and I honestly, I had a, pl- I mean, I developed a plan and I thought it was going to work out really well. So, so Croce had said, Hey, of course, I'll help you try to find something. And he said, if you were to end up around this area, you know, we'd love for you to volunteer. Like, Hey, there's a spot here if you figure something out. Um, and so I actually applied and I went through this lengthy interview process with this, um, like low level entry level, um, Columbus kind of state politics, you know, intern aid type position. And I thought, okay, this, this works. Like I'll kind of use what I've learned a little bit. I'm not a big, you know, for being a political science major, really liking it. I'm not really into party politics that much, but Hey, I just thought this was, you know, sounded like a fit. I can live in Columbus. I can drive to Kenyon via games and practices. And then kind of at the last minute, I got to the final group with that job and it fell through and I, well, it did fall through. I didn't get it. And that was pretty late. That was right before graduation. So after graduation, um, I end up back at home on the couch with no plans. And I essentially spent the entire summer uh, you know, sending out hard copy resumes and cover letters to jobs that uh, I saw posted on NCAA.com, um, you know, and once in a while checking in with my college coach to see if he had heard of anything. So, um, so I, you know, I trying to think of if I had one or two division three interview opportunities. And then to be honest, I was also, uh, exploring, um, secondary school routes, uh, you know, independent school teaching and coaching jobs. And, and, and I interviewed actually for a couple of those that I probably would have taken. And, and I also did not get those jobs. So, um, so, uh, my first job came about, um, one place that had posted uh, an open assistant job and it was structured as a grad assistant was division three Washington college in Maryland. And so I, I, I mean, I probably sent out 30 plus letters, resumes, cover letters, all that to places that I'd seen. And I think I got two responses. I think one was a polite, this position is filled. And the other was uh, Rob Nugent at Washington college uh, calling me and, and offering me an interview. And so that was in Maryland. I'm in New Hampshire. And I I didn't quite understand at first um, some of the lengths you have to go. And he said, well, you have to drive down here and we don't cover travel for the interview and that kind of thing. Um, We might be able to find somewhere for you to stay on campus. And I I thought about it and kind of politely said, thanks, but no thanks. This was earlier middle of summer and I, I had some other irons in the fire per se. So... Then I struck out with stuff, frankly, and I kind of went back to the drawing board and I said, you know, maybe that wasn't a good idea. Let me call him back. So I called him back and I said, hey, you know, I, I changed my mind. If anything is still available, I would be really interested. I'll, I'll make the drive down. Uh, I, you know, I don't know if I apologize, but I certainly, um, you know, impressed upon him. I was highly interested. And what I didn't know behind the scene was they actually had two grad assistant positions and another one had just opened and he hadn't even posted it yet. And it was just kind of timing. So he felt lucky on his end because he had liked me a month or two before and um, would have given me an interview then. And now he was probably pulling his hair out because he had to find somebody else, which he didn't expect late in the summer. And he, so he said, yeah, sure, you can come down. So I, I drove down, um, stayed, they, they had a little apartment on campus. I stayed there, interviewed with uh, with Rob all day the next day. And then, um, you know, he offered me the position a day or two later and I, I took it. So you get there and this is something that you kind of weren't like, again, you hear there's all different kinds of stories, right? Arlen, right. where you have dudes who are, man, I've been waiting to be a coach since I was six mm-hmm. years old and drawing plays on a napkin and all that stuff. And, right. and then you have guys that come to it more like you do, where it's kind of your playing career ends and, you want to be involved in the game or it's just is something that, Hey, this seems like a good opportunity. Let me grab it. So as you get into that first year, do you know right away that, Hey, this is something that I'm in the right place or was it more of a gradual build? Um, I think it was a little bit of a gradual build, but it, I think it kind of hit me really after my one year at, at Washington college. So, so that year, 
So that position, um, I think it's changed there since then. But at the time, uh, almost all of the assistant coach positions at the college were structured as grad assistant positions. Um, and they had a very small grad program. And so I was taking graduate classes. And this was one of the uh, attractions was, like I said, I, I, I wanted to be in coaching, but I was kind of one foot in at the time. Um, my, my parents were supportive of it and they were more supportive of it because, hey, you're still pursuing education. My parents um, both completed graduate education and, and were big supporters of, of that. So um, I was a poli-sci major. There was a um, history subject matter graduate program. And I still in the back of my head thought maybe, maybe teaching uh, or teaching and coaching could be a future for me. So, you know, I saw it as a good opportunity, just a good opportunity to kind of begin graduate school and get experience in coaching. Um, so, you know, but after that year, you know, which was a difficult season for us, which was anticipated, uh, we were super, the team was super young and like uh, literally had the 12 freshmen and I think three senior, yeah, three seniors and maybe three other returning players. We were so young that the team was really good the year before and they had seven or eight seniors. They had a, a great team that year. So it was just a total rebuild and we won five games, I think. And in my feeling after the season was, you know, that this was really difficult. I had a great time. I, I loved it. You know, I just, I loved it. I loved being at practice. Um, I thought I was getting better in certain areas. Uh, you know, for being really young, Rob gave me a lot of responsibility I thought I got along with the guys well. Um, I just I felt like I was learning a lot and having a great time. And I loved still having a team and being a part of the team. And I think I, I don't know that I really said anything to anyone, but I think in my mind, I you know, hey, if I finish this grad program, cool. But um, you know, I think I was really focused on coaching, on college coaching at that point. So you need an opportunity to go back to your alma mater. How does that happen? Um, <laughs> so, uh, uh, I laugh because Matt Crosley called me and, uh, truth be told, he called me about somebody else. So he called me to say, uh, Hey, not, not to name drop here. Um, but he called me and said, Hey, I, I was buddies with Dale. I'm still friends with Dale Wellman. So I didn't mention this. Dale was, I know he's been on your, on your podcast. Um, Dale was the, our assistant coach my freshman year at Kenyon. Um, so he was young, kind of early on in his coaching career. So we, he was with us my freshman year. Then he left when the head coach left. And then when I got that, that when I got into coaching, when I was hired at Washington College, I was, Rob Nugent, my head coach, had been at Williams previously. So he and Dale were in the Williams kind of coaching tree. So he reconnected with me. He reached out to me and just said, hey, you know, um, been, been a few years, but, you know, like to connect and, and um, you know, be in touch and that kind of thing. So anyway, so he was at Williams. Matt Crosley called me, said, hey, do you have any idea if Dale would be interested? And I said, I don't think so. I think Dale's pretty set at Williams. And I said, but, I, I you know, I'm kind of interested. Um, and and Co Crosley thought I was kind of locked in for another year. Um so we so we talked. Um, so we talked, and, and it was a good fit, and and went from there. And that was that was a difficult decision. The the grad program was structured to be two years. Um, you know, I didn't sign anything. There was no formal commitment. Um, the Kenyan job was full time back then. Uh, it was a full time assistant job, not a super high salary, but you know, really low cost of living in Central Ohio. And I still had that tug a little bit of alma mater of you know my college coach and alma mater and. Um, and still, still kind of had a, you know, close relationships there. So, um, so, you know, it, it, like I said, I wasn't thinking as much about grad school at that point in time. So, um, so it seemed like a good fit and that's, that we went that direction. What was it like working for somebody that you played for? <laughs> it was, uh, it was great. I mean, it was, it was great. We had a good relationship, um, when I played and, uh, you know, that of course continued. And, um, of course I got to be a part of some of the conversations, you know, that you don't get to see as players and, um, back in the office. And, um, 
and that kind of thing. And then those conversations are, a lot of them are about, you know, some of my friends. I mean, the older guys on the team at Kenny when I went back were guys I played with and were friends with in college. And, you know, and that, that dynamic, um, that dynamic was hard at times. Uh, certainly was hard because they knew me as more than a coach, you know. Um, so I had to be good, but uh, just just good in terms of, you know, trying to walk that line. And, and, and they were. And they, you know, they realized, they knew, hey, I, I wanted to coach. and But uh, but working for working for Crosey was great. Um, it was great. And so I was there two years with him, and we were very close to this day. When you had an opportunity at, Mid- at Middlebury for two years before you go to Cornell, talk about those two stops, what you learned as an assistant coach at those two places that eventually led to – the opportunity that you got at Wentworth. Sure. Um, you know, I thought one thing I did really well when I was young and an assistant, um, you know, a couple of things was be, you know, really pretty honest. And, and a lot of this happens, you know, just a, as you network. Um, I did a pretty good job, like, like a lot of guys, but, you know, in the summer after Washington College, I was out at camps. I was at Hoop Group a lot and I just kind of got out there and jumped in the car and threw a bag in there and went wherever I could go and and start to meet people and, and connect a little bit and uh, and the camp scene was fun. You know, I just thought it was fun to be make a little bit of money and hang out with a bunch of guys your age who were in the same, you know, on the same path, you know, I'm trying to make it in coaching and um, and I, I enjoyed that and you know, through that, you start to just look around and see where guys get jobs. And, and, um, you know, I thought I did a really good job of paying attention to the market and being really honest with myself. Um, you know, as a guy, I I don't have family coaching connections. I wasn't a great player. Um, and just understanding that, you know, I think you've got to, you know, really work hard and be, of course, be loyal and do the best job in your job where you are. But I think at the same time, you also, you really have to not to use the word selfish, but I I think you really have to look for opportunities um, because it's a, it's a really competitive saturated uh, industry. And, and I think I did a pretty good job of that. And so Kenyon, I think on the resume was good and it was a great experience. Um, You know, uh, Matt was coach of the year one of the years there. We finished fourth in the NCAC one year regular season, which was the highest in a long, long time. And then <clears throat> we finished fifth or sixth the next year, but we won a, a conference tournament game at Wittenberg. Um, first time also that that had happened in a long, long time. So, um, so we had some, some pretty good years, but, um, but anyways, I, I think it was, I think I was pretty good at looking around, you know, at, at trying to pay attention and, being from New England, uh, Middlebury is in the conference, the NESCAC, uh, which is really, a, a, you know, a, a national level group of schools academically and athletically. And I, I just saw a lot of people, frankly, getting jobs from that league, um, if that made sense. You know, look, think, I just started to think that that if I could get to that league as an assistant, that could really help me in, um, you know, in progressing as, as a college coach. So, um so I, I had got out there. I had uh, honestly, honestly, again, through just connection with Dale Wellman, I'd worked Williams camp. Um, they used to run a big, big summer elite camp. Um, I actually had an interview with their head coach at, at one point and, um, and another candidate was, was hired. And then shortly after, I honestly can't remember if it was the next summer or if it was that summer, but, the Middlebury assistant job was open and I pursued it and was able to get an interview with Jeff Brown and was offered that opportunity. And I'd been at Kenyon two years. Um, and I just felt like it was, it was a, you know, a really good move. So, um, so I don't know if that, if that answers your question, but, um, you know, I was so fortunate. I get to Middlebury. The team is loaded. I mean, great. Um, just as a college, uh, they're, their athletic success broadly in so many sports is, is so impressive. And it's just a really impressive place in terms of the athletic culture. Um, I think in, in the student body and the alumni. Um, so that was part of it, but our, our team was really, really good. Uh, and so after my first, to try to answer your question a little bit better, after my first year, 
at Middlebury, um, we went to the silly tournament. We lost in the second round. We lost in the NESCAC final. You know, we, we were very, very good. I think we were um, 20 something and 24 and 4 or something along those lines. And um, I had a couple of opportunities after that year. One was a, a volunteer assistant job at a different Ivy League school. And one was a second assistant job at a Division II school. And I considered both. And I said, no, um, I don't know if that was the right decision. It's really hard to play right and wrong with these, right? Um, cause you don't know exactly the result, but, um, sure. but we were returning everyone, but one, one guy in our rotation at Middlebury. We had just been top 25. We returned everyone and Hey, winning, winning is fun. <laughs> and, uh, Absolutely. you know, we just had great people on our team. Um, you know, working for coach Brown is, is a great experience. And so, so I went back. So I went back for year two. Um, and then we were even better. Uh, we went 28 and two. You know, we, we beat Williams at Williams in the NESCAC final. Um, we went to the national final four for the first time in, in school history. We, we lost a close game to St. Thomas and they, they won the national championship that year. So, um, so that, so one thing that happened that kind of made me realize how difficult this is. Was we had a fantastic year, twenty and two, you know, end end to end, great team. Our our two losses, one was to Williams in the regular season, who didn't have our best player, and then one was to St. Thomas, who won the national championship. You know, final D three poll, we were third in the country. I mean, it, it doesn't get a lot better than that, you know. Um, so right. we, we had a fantastic year, and I thought I kind of made some good, pro- you know, a couple worked a couple different places, and there was a uh, state school in Vermont, smaller school um, that had their uh, head coach opening. And so I, I kind of thought, Hey, I, I think I have enough of a resume. I, you know, I, I wasn't delusional to think, Oh, I'm, I'm a shoe in for this position by no means. But I thought maybe, especially being in state in with the success, the program it had, maybe I can, you know, maybe get involved and have some interview experience, you know, get a phone interview and that kind of thing. And I didn't, I didn't hear it all. You know, I, I applied and just kind of thought, Hey, I, I think, you know, the program, that I was pursuing had been, had been not very successful and I didn't hear anything. And so that I think was a little bit of a wake up call of, Hey, you know, it's just so, so difficult and really have to, you know, try to build your resume, build um, your experience and working for different people is a good, is a great thing. Um, and you know, working at different schools and, and honestly connecting as you move along and you meet other coaches, other administrators, like those relationships and connections can be so, so valuable. Um, so, so I, I kind of realized through that, Hey, I'm, I might have to keep going. Um, and then, uh, Cornell opportunity opened and, um, and so I went through that, that process and I said, okay, you know, maybe I need to try to, try to get to the Ivy league and, and, uh, I was fortunate that was late. Uh, that was kind of late in the summer, but was fortunate to be offered that opportunity. What was the difference from coaching at the division three level to coaching at the division one level at Cornell? What were some of the things that you kind of had to adjust to? I think, I think the, the biggest difference as a, I mean, at Middlebury, the school as a Kenyan to some degree, but there's some national draw there. But we didn't really have at the time a, a big budget at Middlebury to really go nationally, if that makes sense. So, um, you know, camps that attracted kids from different parts of the country and just kids coming to visit, that's kind of how you would do that. But at Cornell, we really recruited nationally. We had the budget, you know. Um, so, so all of a sudden, just the recruiting footprint is is all over the country. Um, and kids from California, kids from Texas, you know, all, all over the place. So that's a good experience. Um you know, I think the biggest difference is it, it really, it's, there are some quiet periods, but, you know, Division One and Ivy League even, you know, it's much more of a almost year-round experience um, in terms of in the gym with coaches, you know, if that makes sense. So, it Division does. Three, you know, Division Three, you just don't have, uh, you know, structure time with the players or players with the coaches as much so that is that's a big difference and and i i wanted that i wanted more work in the gym i wanted you know division three you come up you know your time is really team practice and team development and you're division one 
there's your, your workouts, small group workouts, one-on-one workouts. And that was something I didn't have a lot of experience in. So it was really good for me uh, to do that. When you think about your time there and you go through and just consider all the responsibilities that you had and the things that you were able to learn as part of that, what, what stands out for you as probably the biggest takeaway from your time at Cornell? My biggest takeaway, um, that's a good, that's a good question. I mean, I thought, uh, I think the, the basketball world is really, really big, you know, and I thought that put me in just, uh, helped me realize that. I think I'd been, of course, Ohio for a couple of years, but the East coast really after that. And it really, uh, you know, our, our head coach, Bill Courtney, who was a great division one player and worked for, uh, Jim Laranega for a long time. And, and, you know, his, kind of getting into a, a different coaching network in his coaching experience, his playing experience uh, overseas, but just being exposed a little bit to um, the higher levels of, of college basketball, of, of Division I and, and learning a lot about it was a, was a really good exposure, was really good experience, um, you know, and then the uh, we're traveling all over the country for non-league games. Um, we played a lot of uh, a lot of big TV games in two years there, and that was really good experience. And you know, I think I think you realize, hey, basketball is basketball, but you move up levels, and then there's so many other parts of the job. Like the the other parts take up more of your time, to be honest. So obviously, there's just um, you know more in terms of there's more recruiting and uh, people, you know that need your time as a head coach. Uh, obviously there's like a booster club and there's appearances and there's stuff like that. And you've got to uh, be all kind of connected as a staff and the schedule and, and all of that. So that, that is a, also another part is um, when I was at Kenyon, I was the full-time assistant. We had kind of a volunteer. I was at Middlebury again, not, not quite a full-time assistant in terms of how it was structured, but i I committed myself full time and we had a volunteer and then at, at Cornell, I go there and Hey, you're part of a staff. Um, right. so, you know, it's more people to learn from, to connect with. Um, and it's, and it's more of a, a dynamic, you know, I'm going in kind of as the third assistant and, um, and those relationships and connections certainly help just as much as, as working for the head coach. So there, yeah. there, there was a lot, you know, it just kind of became a bigger, bigger world and there was a lot more to it to some to some degree um you know the coaching is coaching but at division three it's a little more focused in certain areas and then division one there's just more you have to handle and more you have to do your first impression is everything when applying for a new coaching job a professional coaching portfolio is the tool that highlights your coaching achievements and philosophies and most of all, helps separate you and your abilities from the other applicants. The Coaching Portfolio Guide is an instructional membership-based website that helps you develop a personalized portfolio. Each section of the Portfolio Guide provides detailed instructions on how to organize your portfolio in a professional manner. The guide also provides sample documents for each section of your portfolio that you can copy, modify, and add to your personal portfolio. As a Hoopheads Pod listener, you can get your Coaching Portfolio Guide for just $25. Visit coachingportfolioguide.com slash hoopheads to learn more. All right. So at some point during your tenure at Cornell, there has to be in your mind at least sort of these two paths that you can take, right? Because now you're at Cornell. It's a Division I school. You're in the Ivy League. You're probably – years away if you stay on that track of getting an opportunity to be a head coach, but certainly there was an opportunity based on your resume and the success that you had for you to be able to move up a chair or two at Cornell eventually or to move to another school and be able to continue to climb that assistance ladder with the idea that you could stay in Division One, or with your experience at the Division Three level and you had already started thinking about applying for those head coaching jobs back when you were at Middlebury, was the job at Wentworth, one that, okay, this job opens up and let me see what happens and I could be happy going in either path or after those two years, did it kind of become clear to you that you wanted to go to Division Three? Just what were you thinking during that time? Yeah, it was, uh, to be honest, it was 
hey, this is interesting and I want to explore it a little bit and see if it might be a fit. So, um, you know, I was open to both directions. Uh, I certainly, you know, know and, and learned, of course, a lot more of the, you know, the Division One financial upside and, um, and certainly how much, you know, a couple of years all of a sudden you can go from, um, you know, one job and be totally, and a lot of, a lot of it is network. And, um, if you're an assistant coach, does your head coach get another job, you know, get offered a, a job or a promotion? Um, so I, I was open minded. Uh, you know, I, back, I think they changed it, but back then the third assistant job in the Ivy League was a restricted earnings or really no salary job. And each school tried to, uh, kind of help out or make it work. You know, I, I was, um, I was paid through some camp uh, funds and then would kind of find some other ways just to, just to survive. But it was really a stepping stone job. And, and I think my, <clears throat> between my two years at Middlebury to taking the Cornell job, I was starting to, because of just working these Ivy League prospect camps, meet more people and learn a little bit about that because I was trying to figure out what was the next step when I was at Middlebury. Um, so, you know, I, I knew, it's, it's a funny dynamic because you're there and you don't want to root for your friends, your, your, the other assistants to leave. But in a way, if they leave, that's your easiest path to a more stable coaching situation at that level, if that makes sense. So I was open to, um, you know, I, I interviewed at for third assistant and director of operations jobs, um, with a couple of division one colleges and programs. And then I was also trying to look at open division three opportunities And in my head. When I went into Cornell, I, I was, I kind of had a two year clock. Um, I, I didn't think I, it made a lot of sense. I, I don't know if, if I had not got the one work job, I don't know what, um, what I was hired in July. Maybe some stuff would have happened later, but it was a little bit of, Hey, I've been here two years, I'm 29 years old. And it's very, very simple. I, I need to, you know, figure something out. I want to stay in coaching. And, and like you said, I had, so, I had a lot of division three experience, I had a little division one, um, and Wentworth, there's some great things about Wentworth when at first, when I first learned about it, I didn't know a lot, but when you really, when I really dove into it, um, especially location, 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 it offered so much. So I, so I went through the whole process and, and, uh, here I am. So, so obviously Boston is a big draw, but what else about the school? made it one that you felt like was attractive, some place that you could build the type of program that you kind of envisioned? Well, I think for one, the school uh, still had, at that time, you could see an upward trajectory, kind of a, a positive path for the, for the college, for the university. Um, and that has continued and, and is continuing. So I, I think just the growth of Wentworth was, was attractive. So, at that time, it was clear that the athletic department was continuing to build a little bit. And I've been here 10 years now. And when I was hired in 2013, we still had a lot of part-time head coaches. Uh, men's basketball was men's basketball and women's basketball were full-time, as well as a few others. But uh, we have made a lot of those part-time head coaches into full-time positions. We have added a lot of sport. Uh, we've added a few sports, I think three, maybe four. So just uh, upside, upside was a big part of it. Location was a big part of it. Comfort and familiarity with the New England area um, certainly was, you know, I, I, hey, I, I said location, but I spent most of my 20s living in uh, really small towns, you know, great places, but really small towns. And all of my, all my close friends lived in Boston, New York, or Washington, D.C. And uh, anytime I had a weekend, I, I would hit one of those places and, you know, hang out, be on the, sleep on the couch and visit my friends. So, you know, so getting close to 30 and an opportunity to be in the Boston area and see, see a little bit of what I was made of being a head coach was, was definitely an attractive opportunity. And, and I go back. The last thing, sorry, I should, I should say. You know, my background and I think my upbringing a little bit, um, I, I think I felt comfortable somewhere where the academic piece was important. And, and that is the case at, at Wentworth. It's, it's a very good school and our students 
care about school. And I think while my college experience was very different in terms of location and type of college, uh, I just think just school being important, very important to our students and their families was a good fit for me. Looking back over your 10 years, when you think about those first few months on the job and kind of what you were thinking about, if you can remember back that far, but thinking about what you felt like you needed to do to be able to build the program compared to when you sit here today and think about what it was that actually was most important. How do those two things compare? Did you, were you, did you, did you have it right as you were thinking about what it was going to take or did you have it wrong and you ended up having to do something different? Just how do you think about the success that you've had and what led to you being able to build the program that you have? Sure. Um, no, there's not much overlap, frankly. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had a lot of thoughts back then and, and I think a lot of them are, are different now, but um, you know, I think I learned a lot and I think I really approached the first year with an understanding that um, while I was from New England, Middlebury is way up there and, and I knew that conference well, but the, our whole world here, our league and a lot of the other schools in, the, in Boston City and just the greater area, you know, I didn't know the ins and outs yet. So I, I knew going in, I was going to have to figure a lot of things out and I was fine then my first year hey let's make a bunch of mistakes let's let's try to make a lot of you know and and i meant that in terms of my recruit you know i, I think the things that carried over are i, I knew recruiting is going to be super super important and i really threw myself into that right away and then you know and then part two the obvious one is hey you, you've got to build some relationships and have really strong relationships that that is that doesn't matter where you are and then a lot of the other stuff has probably probably changed, right? But um, and our school our school has changed a little bit a little bit too. So you know we got to stay on your toes and make some adjustments. But um, yeah, I, I, I tried to go in open minded, and um, my recruiting approach approach was really we're going to try to recruit anyone we know about, just anyone and everyone. I want a lot. I want honestly to just lose a lot of recruiting battles. I want to figure out who do we lose to? Why do we lose to those places? You know, from a, from a perspective, family and student perspective, where do we not quite, you know, what's the difference when we're in the final group um, and be able to kind of hear from people. So I really just, you know, wanted to, you know, be broad and cast a huge net in recruiting in trying to learn, try to try to figure some things out and learn a little bit about how things would go. Um, and then, you know, make some adjustments moving forward. What'd you learn? What were some of the things that maybe early mistakes that you made in terms of recruiting and yeah. who you thought you could get in with? What did that look like? You know, I think, um, I think as the season went on and the year went on, I think one thing, I, I think I focused too much on recruiting during our season and at other times. I think I was constantly always uh, trying to figure out how were we going to practice and I was going to get in the car and deal with Boston traffic and get to a high school game. And I think <laughs> I just really learned that you've got to be able to focus on the players in your program. Most important people are the kids in your program. They're already there. That that kid playing at that school, he shouldn't, he doesn't measure up, you know, he's not in the program yet really at times have to just strip it down. The most important people are the kids in the program. So um, I think I was trying to coach and recruit um, at, at times and was my attention was a little too divided, uh, if that makes sense. So um, so I think, you know, and that was a, a bit paranoia is a strong word, but I was just trying, you know, a little, uh, again, trying to have a presence early and get out early and be all over the place and looking back probably wasted some time now in recruiting you're always gonna spend some time that doesn't pan out that's how it is you know um but i think i think because of doing some of that early was able to kind of refine our approach and be smarter and more efficient so um you know i think i think in recruiting i just really really wanted to learn from our players what made them choose Wentworth and what 
did they love about their experience and going to college in Boston? You know, like I said earlier, myself as a 17 or 18 year old kid, I, I had no interest in being in the city. But there's 200,000 college kids in Boston. Clearly, there's something here. <laughs> they're, they're having a pretty good time. Uh, Boston is obviously a huge sports town. So I, I just needed to learn uh, the best ways to market and sell the experience here, the school. Um, the first thing I did when I got on campus was walk to admissions and take the admissions tour. I make every assistant I ever hired do that first week they're here. Go to, you need to go to admissions, take the tour, hear from the student who's walking you around what life is like. Look at some of the places that you wouldn't, you know, as an assistant coach, hey, you want to go to the gym, you want to go to the office and do coaching, you do some X's and O's and that kind of thing. You go learn about the school so when you're talking to students and families, you can really articulate the strengths of this place. That's what, you know, so, so I think that was my approach back then. I think that was, that was a pretty good, um, pretty good mindset back then. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. What about as a head coach being comfortable in your own skin? Do you feel like right away you kind of had a feel for who you were as a coach? Or do you feel like, again, that was more of something that a year, two years, three years in where you really started to get a grasp on what you wanted to do and, and who you wanted to be as a head coach? Yeah, I think it's always a process. Um, I certainly, in, in some ways, yes, I had some comfort, but I definitely lacked some conviction in certain areas. I definitely, uh, and that and that developed, that developed, and just in terms of how how certain things in the program need to go from from practice, even playing style, uh, managing roster and players, and player relationship and dynamics and. And the, the biggest challenge for me was just really encountering, uh, I would call it decision fatigue as a head coach. Uh, just the amount of, you know, many, many of them small, but the day to day decisions that have to be made just to run the program and players, co- assistant coaches coming to you in terms of what are we doing with this? What is the plan for this? And, um, and just having a hard time, you know, having a little bit of stress over all of that. And then, and now, and then you learn from that, you know, now it's, it's pretty easy. I know, hey, I know when I want the bus to leave, I know if we're going to, we're going to walk through, we're going to shoot around, how long is that going to be? And, and so many other things that as an assistant coach, I didn't run through my head. Now I, I think I worked for all head coaches that really had a good idea for what they want. And maybe I took it for granted that that decision was already made or seemed easy, if that makes sense. And then when it's your decision, it does. when it's your decision and it's your school and sometimes things can be different and it's your players and um, all of a sudden <laughs> it's uh, you get, a, you can get a little stress. Um, so, so that was, that was a certainly a learning experience. Do you delegate more, of those decisions, is it easier to delegate today than it was back when you first started? Uh, yeah, de- delegating and dividing responsibility is definitely uh, a little bit easier now. I think with, with a lot of those decisions, it, it they just with experience now. I know, you know, hey, when I look at the schedule, wh- whatever it is, if it's a schedule conflict, if it's a, a game day routine, game day travel, home game routine, all of that stuff, just from experience, you know, I, I think there's, it's just so much easier. Um, sometimes you do something, you learn it doesn't work. Okay. You, you make a fix and, and then that's easier. Dele- delegation definitely is. Um, yeah, I think ha- I, that, that's a really good question because you make me think back. And I think my first year I tried to take on too much, I tried to do too much and you've got to have a great staff. We have, we have a fantastic staff and, We've been really lucky to have really, really committed, hardworking, good people um, who are willing to go above and beyond. And um, I think we, we have two assistants who have you know, been with us for six or seven years now. And I feel fortunate that we've had so much longevity with them. So, um, so, so, yeah. How did you build your style of play in terms of the way you wanted your team to look out on the floor? You can take that offensively, defensively both, however you want to look at it, but just how did you, when you started to think about what you wanted your teams to look like, how did you build that out? So, you know, with the head coaches I worked for um, at Washington College, 
Rob Nugent, Coach Nugent, who unfortunately does not coach college anymore. I believe he's back in the high school game out in Montana. But Rob was a diehard uh, triangle offense aficionado and, and Tex Winter disciple. He was, so he was a system guy. He had his system, and there was uh, there was no discussion ever about doing anything different. This was what we did. This was Washington College basketball. And then, uh, so it was, so that's a really good experience to see. And then the other coaches I worked for were more strengths, but they, you know, more strength based in their approach, trying to build their system around, uh, the players a little bit year to year. That was, that was really the approach that I took when I came in here was trying to, I, I had a, an idea just for some things that I liked and felt comfortable teaching. And then, uh, after year one, we changed some things and we, we had a, I'd say a style of play for a few years. And, and I think it was, you know, a lot of off season learning for me and just try again, year one, trying to figure out, um, where are we going to recruit from? What are the types of players we, we can get and want to get that fit here in just trying to look big picture and decide on some things that, that I was comfortable with that I liked and that, fit uh, or likely roster. And then we've been, you know, so we, for some years we were really, really strong and good defensively. And that was where we um, kind of built our identity. And then it's adjusted, changed a little bit over there. So I think a lot of it also is just, you know, just experience and paying attention to, to trends, but also your conference and what is successful in your league. And, um, and, we have been fortunate to have a really great run of good inside players and post players here. So that's something that's always been an important piece of what we've done is, is simply post play. Um, but we've had to make some adjustments year to year a little bit, just with just what are, what are the other aspects of our offense. So, so a little bit of it is experience um, here as a head coach. And then a lot of it, of course, was experience as, as the- what's the process for taking your, system and the way you like to play and looking from one season to the next sort of the tweaks that you're going to make obviously you're looking at personnel but just what's the process are you sitting down first by yourself kind of come up with ideas are you sitting down with your assistant coaches are you watching film and breaking things down just how do you go about thinking about the things that you may want to tweak or change from year to year you know i think one part of that is during the season encountering certain challenges or realizing that we're a little weak in a certain area where we don't have within our package, within our system, um, you know, a way to use a certain type of player or or anything. I think I've honestly just taken some notes during the season because and once you get into the throws of January, and February, I mean, you don't have a ton of practice time always. And the conference play kind of comes at you pretty fast. And installing something that they, you know, the one day between a game or something like that, pretty hard. So just for me, kind of keeping track through the season of, hey, what's something we need to go back and look at? And then in the off season, really just diving into our film and also our statistics, also trying to you know, have somewhat of a data-based approach to, um, I think we can all have our own coaching bias. And I, I think taking some time off after the season from thinking about this stuff and then coming back to it, um, you know, remove that some time, uh, then, you know, in, in there and then going back to watching film, sometimes you have a different reaction. You say, I don't even remember that we, we did that. <laughs> yeah. We tried. So this. true. Um, and Hey, I I mean, and part of it is a study of your players. So I mentioned we've had a few pretty good post players and we had had one who had a, this is years ago, and I was really mad at myself. There's been times where I watch and I realize, and Synergy can help with this now because you can click on a city. I want to watch every guy's pick and roll, you know, or I want to watch every guy's ball screen use and you can run it like that. But, you know, I'm just watching film and realizing (laughs) that this big guy that we have for a right-handed guy actually prefers to go over his right shoulder. A ton of right-handed guys like to turn left shoulder, right? So just really mad at myself that I, I didn't, I just didn't pick up on that that much. And, you know, that certainly should be 
a factor in what block we put them on and what way we run certain things. And so I think a big part of it is just your summer, you know, evaluation um, through, through film, through a lot of film and combining that, of course, with, you know, we all love to watch film and check out other programs and, and try to think creatively about what can we add? What do we need to drop? How can we adjust what we do? Um, so I think it's, it's mostly an off season process, but for, for me, a lot of times it's, you know, Hey, realizing getting to this conference opponent and something specific that they do, um, I don't know, make it you know, whatever fronting the post or doing this or how they guard based on out of bounds and us not really having an answer at that point in time. Right. So realizing, Hey, okay, we need to, you know, in our, in our preseason and our weeks where we really have a lot of practice and we're building our system and, um, and enforcing habits, uh, we need to have an answer for this stuff. So, so I think that is one thing we've done a pretty good job of. What have you done with your eight days? We use six and we save two. Uh, so one, we just put on October 14th, which is a Saturday, a lot of gym time on Saturday. So we use, we essentially started, a day early, and then we used five in late September. So we went on Monday, Tuesday, and then on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, and a lot of that was due to gym schedule, but I just liked how it worked out for us. Um, you know, I, I liked just having the experience, especially for our new guys, of having to go one day and then come right back in the gym the next day, you know, and carry over something you learned, um, you know, because you could go, hey, you could go, Tuesday, Thursday, or Monday, Wednesday for three weeks or four weeks or whatever you want. I just kind of like putting them together, to be honest. And you feel like you're going to do that same thing again next year because you felt like it worked well? Yeah, I think, I mean, if we did the same thing next year, I think I feel okay with it. I, I think I want to look at the calendar a little bit more, but, you know, we are, we start school, um, the Thursday after Labor Day here. That's later, a little bit later than most places. So you know, Labor Day weekend is kind of move in. And then, you know, we didn't do anything as a team except for meet for the first couple of weeks. I think we just kind of let our guys get moved in, get their feet on the ground, um, get our freshmen kind of move in the right direction and paperwork done and all that stuff. And then we got to get in the gym. Um, and I thought, and then, we stayed away from the long weekend in October and let the kids all kind of go home, uh, have that break before we really start the season. So I, I would try to do something probably similar. Um, you know, we really talked as a program that, you know, one of the goals of this is to help, you know, help improve the time where there aren't coaches when you're in the gym and the coach isn't there. Let's try to improve your, you know, captain's practices, your, pickup games um, by adding a little bit of structure and some concepts that you need to think about instead of having a month and a half of pickup games where we're, you know, hopefully we're using some team concepts and, and habits, but, <laughs> you know, hopefully, right. You know, hopefully, right. <laughs> and hopefully, and, and I think, I think, I think some, you know, I think generally there's some, but definitely not the level that some coaches would like um, if we, you know, if we watch, which we, which we don't, but, um, but yeah, we got to kind of, you know, get those practices in and say, Hey, you guys are going to have some chances to be in the gym. You know, be, be intentional, be intentional and organized with what you're doing. Run, run this basic structure of the offense and try to really try to have some discipline with certain things because you're going to be held accountable for those things in three or four weeks. What about the two days that you saved? Really the, the planet there is just to, to try to jumpstart the player development process. And I, I'm really thankful, happy to have those days. You know, I always feel kind of weird just having a talk with a guy about need to get better at ABC and here are some drills or here's how you can do that, but not actually be able to go in the gym. Right. And I, right. I don't, yep. you know, you feel like really what's, what's the downside, you know, why, why shouldn't we be able to do that? So, we really, really take a lot of pride and are really committed to an improvement and player development process. And we're really proud of a lot of the guys who have come through the program who have not really um, got all, simply got a lot of playing time, not really been high impact players at first and have grown into really high impact and some all conference players. And 
So I think that can help us with that. And, you know, I just, I just think that's, that's at the, the core of how we run the program and communicate you know, to our guys. Um, you know, recruiting is of course super, super important, but we just, we really, really, really impressed, uh, emphasize the importance of them improving themselves and their opportunity to get better. And we just really use a lot of examples of guys who have come through the program. And, um, and so I think those days can help us with that, uh, even more. Yeah. I really think that the number of guys that we've talked to Arlen about just how they're going to use their days. And I, I really think that being able to have a couple of those days at the end of the season, as you said, to really go through with guys and be like, okay, here's what we want you to work on. Let's actually get out on the court and show you what that looks like. I think that's a really good way to head into your off season and give your guys some concrete things that they can work on. Cause we can all sit in a coach's office and talk about it, but I think being able to actually see it on the floor and clearly I'm sure there's things that you've talked with your players about, during the season about them improving and getting better, but just to kind of be able to put a, put a bow on it, so to speak at the end of the season and, and really send them off in a positive way to me. I mean, that makes, makes a ton of sense. I want to wrap up asking you one final two part question. So part one, when you think about the next year or two ahead of you, what do you see as being the biggest challenge? And then the second part of the question is when you think about what you get to do every day, your biggest joy. So your biggest challenge and then your biggest joy. If it were acceptable, which it's not to uh, steal word for word, someone else who's been on your podcast, I would just steal uh, what Jeff Duran said about commitment to family and balancing that with commitment to program. But I don't want to do that. So um, I think my answer in terms of biggest challenge for us, for our program is, uh, is achieving consistency, greater consistency. So we've had some pretty good seasons last year. We consider very good season here. Um, but we've also had some, some not so good seasons. And I think for us, it's trying to, to not get ahead of ourselves, not really rest on, you know, what happened in a you know, previous year. But have more consistency, build more consistency as a program, because if you can string together a bunch of really good years, then you have a better chance of breaking through one of those years, right? So I think for us, that's that's it. Um, I think that's that's really it, is, is being consistently more competitive and uh, in our conference, which is really, really strong in Division Three. And then your biggest joy. Yeah, biggest joy. Um you know, I, I think I've been here 10 years now. I feel a little bit like kind of entering a, the next phase here. And, and by by that, I mean that, you know, we have 10 years of alums and most of them, a lot of, not most of them, but a lot of them live in the greater Boston area. Some of them live in Boston and it's, it's a little bit different than you know, if you like say where I went, Kenyan, hey, maybe you get if you're a coach, you maybe get alums back once a year for alumni day, maybe. You know, our guys who are around still drop in on the Wednesday night conference game and wanna catch up after and hang out. So it's been fun just to see them a little bit more. Or we have our alumni scrimmage on Saturday, so that's our current team versus an alumni team. Um and I, the odds might be in the alumni team favor, quite frankly. Um, so, you know, just I, what I'm trying to say is, you know, kind of seeing their growth and development now as people. Um, I was at a alumni wedding two weekends ago and I missed one in the summer and that killed me. It was really, really hard. I think as a coach, you think you're going to be able to go to all this stuff and I have my own family and you, you can't, you know, and you want to be able to be there for these big moments. But just being able to kind of watch them grow and develop job promotions, a couple of our guys buying houses, um, marriages, babies, that kind of thing. Just all of that going on and having really good feelings about this experience um, being an important part of their life. And then at the same time, still being able to be here and coach and develop kind of the next wave of our lumber basketball alums and um, excitement to coach another year. So. I think that's just, that's a joy. That's a joy is that our, our alumni group is loyal and around and it's just fun to see them and, um, 
a big thing here is our uh, co- commitment as a as a college to career preparation and job placement and all of that. And so all of our guys are pretty early on connected with the alumni who studied the same programs. And um, that's that's kind of a big thing. We, we have a lot of seniors who uh, typically have job offers signed and committed to in like January, something like that. So um, so. So that's that's kind of the joy. That's the joy is just seeing everybody succeed after their time here while continuing to just continuing to coach a, a new group. That's well said. I mean, I always say that getting an opportunity to have an impact on the players that you coach and use the game of basketball to be able to do that. And then obviously for you to feel that by the wedding invites and the the jobs and the babies and all the things that go along with that. I mean, it just is that's really what it's all about. And I think you did a really good job of articulating that before we wrap up. I want to give you a chance to share how people can get in contact with you, find out more about you and your program. So you want to share website, social media, email, whatever you feel comfortable with. And after you do that, I will jump back in and wrap things up. Okay. Awesome. Uh, My email is Galloway A at wit.edu. So that's last name, first initial. So Galloway A at wit.edu. Uh, my cell phone is 603 479 0151. Our program social media, both Instagram and Twitter, is the same handle. It's uh, WIT MBB. So WIT MBB or Whitman Basketball, no spaces. Um, we have a, a decent amount of activity on Instagram, not as much on Twitter these days, but, uh, yeah, follow our program, reach out to me, um, anytime. Um, the one thing I'll, I'll say, I mean, uh, you, you probably have kind of a national reach in terms of your, your podcast, but, uh, the one, one of the things I should have mentioned earlier that really helped me grow as a coach. And I'm, I'm fortunate. This is like, a, this is a great benefit that I hadn't thought about originally of coaching here is there's so many colleges and universities here and I, I, I can go to practice. I can walk down the street and uh, go to practice at Northeastern and watch Bill Cohen run practice, who is a great coach. So um, there, there's so many resources out there, obviously to learn and improve, but I, I think one of the best is go to, go to practice. Um, you know, uh, if you're a youth coach, go to high school, if you're high school, go to college, really make, make that effort, take that time. Um, that, that has been a huge thing for, for me. Yeah. That's a great opportunity, especially when you're close, as you said, that you don't have to get in the car and drive miles and miles and miles to be able to go and watch a college practice. And yeah. clearly for any coach, I don't care what level you're at to be able to go and watch another team's practice. It's always, I think, invaluable to be able to pick up things just in terms of Hey, maybe you pick up a drill, but I think more importantly, just like how do guys pace their practices and sure. how do we go from and transitioning from this to that? And what are the roles like for different coaching staffs? And obviously you go see a big division one school and there's lots of people that are there and have roles. And then you can go watch a division three practice or a high school practice and you can get a different feel. And so I think it's valuable no matter what level you're at to be able to go and learn from, from other coaches. Because again, we all kind of get, I don't want to say necessarily stuck, but we have the things that we do and the way we do it. And I think just to be exposed sometimes gets you to think. And yeah. even if you don't end up necessarily doing a wholesale change, I think there are sometimes just little tweaks or little things that you can pick up that can make a really big difference in what you do. So I think that was a great reminder for coaches that are in the audience of, hey, if you get an opportunity to go out and watch a practice from another school, do it because I think there's just a tremendous amount that can be learned from it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Arlen, I want to say thanks to you for taking the time out of your schedule tonight to jump out with us. Really appreciate it. And to everyone out there, thanks for listening, and we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast, presented by Head Start Basketball.